the Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus spoke to them in a parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have appeared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted calf have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets, and invite anyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets, and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. I'm going to invite our kids to come up and join me. So come on down. <laughs> ah, have a seat. <laughs> so I have a question for you. How many of us here have seen the movie Trolls? Well, adults, you can raise your hand too. <laughs> so do you remember who are the Bergens? Yep. Could be happy. Yep. Anybody else? Who were the Bergens? Were the Bergens the good guys or the bad guys? They were the bad guys. They looked kind of like trolls. And the trolls were. Who were the trolls? Cute little happy things. I like that. <laughs> well. The Bergens thought, for some reason, that the only way that they could be happy was if they ate a troll, right? Because the trolls were like so happy they were just bursting, weren't they? Pretty much, they were fuzzy balls of fun. I like that. Great description of a troll. <laughs> well, in the end of the movie, did the, tro did the Bergens realize that they needed to, did they have to eat a troll to be happy? What did they realize? Exactly. They realized that everyone could be happy on their own once they realized that they needed each other to be happy, right? So what we are reminded of is a little bit like the Bergens and the trolls. Sometimes we tend to think that we need something else to be happy. How many of us think that we need like a tablet to be happy? <laughs> we'll talk after church. <laughs> or a video game. But do those things really make us happy? No. What makes us happy? Friend Friends. Friends. Drawing. Drawing. Sleep. Sleep. I like sleeping. <laughs> Playing outside. Playing outside. Family. Family. Yep, that's a big one. What else makes us happy? That's it. Joy. Joy. Cats. I like uh, dogs. <laughs> Reading. So you see what we realize that when God loves us, we don't need things to remind us that we are loved. We know that happiness and our love comes from where? From inside of our hearts. So this week, I want you to remember as you're playing with your video games and some of the other things, that your real happiness and joy comes from God's love, which comes from our heart. heart. Well, that too. <laughs> well, thank you all so very much.
って。Your sermon will not be that short. <laughs> I have to confess that I absolutely love our Old Testament reading for this morning. The people of Israel are real. In a lot of ways, they are really us. Here they are, they were slaves in Egypt, and they whined to God, and God said, Okay, fine, I'm going to send somebody to free you. So God sends Moses. Now, if you remember that whole burning bush scene and all that stuff, Moses goes, Ten Commandments, the plagues, all this stuff. People get out of Egypt, they come to the Red Sea, they whine to God some more. Well, you brought us out of Egypt to die at the Red Sea. So God says, Okay, take your staff, part the Red Sea. They walk across the sea on dry land, come out the other side, and they complain because the water was too wet. These are people that will find something to complain about. So they complain and they keep going. And then they complain to, to Moses, well, you know, Moses, we had meat and fish and all this succulent food when we were in Egypt, forgetting the part that they were slaves. And so God gives them food in the middle of the desert. The food wasn't enough, so then they're complaining, well, Moses, you brought us out here. We got all this lovely food, but we have nothing to drink. So God tells Moses, hit the rock. Water will come out. We will create streams of water in the desert wherever you go. And you think they would have been happy. But no, of course not. They complain to God. So God, Moses goes up the mountain to spend some time in what I call the teleconference with God to talk about the people. And Moses is gone for a long time. He goes away. For a very long time. And so the people become fearful and they don't understand what is going on. And so they say to Aaron, Hey, Aaron, make something for us to kind of worship. So Aaron takes the jewelry off of their ears and makes them a golden calf that they can worship as God. And then something happens up on the mountain between Moses and God. God says, and this is before the biblical writers cleaned up the whole passage, God says something along the lines to Moses like, you better go down there and talk to those people. <laughs> Your people are down there doing some stuff that they're not supposed to be doing. You can almost hear Moses responding, my people. What do you mean, my people? <laughs> These are your people. Remember, they cried to you. You delivered them. All I did was walk across some water and parted it. That's it. I did my part. These are your people. Sounds like your parents, doesn't it? <laughs> I remember when I was growing up, my grandmother would say to my mother, Your children are in trouble. <laughs> to which my mother would respond, You mean your grandchildren are in trouble? <laughs> We do this back and forth. So suddenly the people belong to somebody else. But here they are complaining. They've done all this. And so Moses and God are in this middle of this conversation. And Moses is actually bribing God. Well, you know, God, this is going to look really bad if you kill all these people. The Egyptians are going to be going to say, look, see, he was no real God. You took these people out in the desert to kill them. And you can almost hear Mo God responding to Moses like, you better watch out. <laughs> Don't cross that line. But then Moses says to him, remember your promise. Remember that you promised Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah. Remember all those people that came before? You promised that they would have descendants that number in the stars. And if you kill them right now, they're not going to have any descendants. So change your mind, God. And the miracle in this story is that God changes God's mind. God sees them create, doing idolatry and changes God's mind and allows them to continue. The funny thing is, 6,000 years later, we are in the same boat, are we not? <laughs> we can find some things to complain about in our lives. And then we will ask the question, well, where is God? Why are you not here to help me out of all of this? And then we go so far as to create a couple idols. Here's the idol test for you. How many of us have more than enough money than, that, than we do, that we don't know what to do with it? How many of us have just enough to get by? 
How many of us could do with a whole lot more? <laughs> now, remember, you're in church, so. <laughs> the thing is, we run the risk sometimes of letting our stuff become our idols. When we start using people instead of things, we create an idol and we worship that. 6,000 years ago, they crafted their earrings and whatnot and made a golden calf. And today, we craft our idols as a way of creating God in our image rather than the other way around. What is interchanged between Moses and God and the people of God or to remind them is that they were created in God's image. In God's image and likeness, God created them. It is when we forget that we are created in God's image that we create idols of things. And in our world, especially now, there are three idols that consume way too much of our time. The first one is the idol of fear. How many of you find something to be fearful or afraid or to worry about? We worry about our world, we worry about our politics, we worry about all kinds of stuff out of fear. And we've managed to peddle fear, especially our political leaders, as a way of getting us to either fall asleep or to look to them to somehow solve all of our problems. But what is the most quoted line in the Bible? Do not be afraid. Because we know that if we follow this Jesus, perfect love casts out fear. We really have nothing to fear, but we create sometimes this idol that we call fear. The other is the idol of power. We love to know that we are in an exclusive, in, in, an exclusive uh, group. Think about it. If you go on an airplane these days, if you are one of the elite members, you get to walk on the little red carpet strip to get onto the plane first. You get priority boarding. And how many of us stand there and watch some of those people go up on the airplane ramp on the little red carpet with elite member status, whatever they call it, and go, you know, I really wish I was on that carpet. <laughs> we love to be in the exclusive club it is a way of creating power. And trust me, our political leaders have come to the conclusion that this idol of power is the idol to worship. Getting power and holding on to it. But God reminds us over and over and over again that there is a time and a place for everything under the heavens. And that those who are in power now will at some point not be in power. No regime, no administration, nothing under this sun lasts forever. And what we're called to do is to take the time that we have to be reminded that we are made in the image of God and that we are, used, we are to use our power, how little or how much it is, for the benefit of all of us. The last idol is certainty. When things fall apart, when our lives are falling apart and things are going wrong, we look to certainty rather than faith. Because the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. When we know exactly who God is going to smite, who God likes, who God does not like, and we can tell without a doubt that we have checked off our 12 boxes and like, oh, I have done everything that I have, we have left no room for God to work. That idol of certainty is perhaps the worst and most vile. This past week, I heard one of our, and I use this term lightly, religious leaders say that the massacre in Las Vegas was punishment for us um, disrespecting the president. Now, I began by saying this was a religious leader who said this. He was certain that this was God's punishment for us disrespecting the president. That's a whole sermon by itself. <laughs> 
But any time that we are so certain that we know the right and that we have God's mind, we have abandoned faith and we're worshiping the idol of certainty. Because the thing is, certainty is an illusion that we really can never grasp. So fear, certainty, and power the three modern-day idols that we find ourselves struggling against. And God stands there calling us over and over and over again to be reminded that you are made in my image and you have nothing to fear. The power that you have is the power of humble service. And that faith, even when things are falling apart, is much more important than certainty that does not last. I love Paul's rejoinder today in our second reading. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known. He calls us in our createdness, in our image of God, to rejoice always in the face of whatever comes. That's part of the reason why I love that movie, Trolls. Those little fuzzy things are about to be eaten and they're singing in harmony, no less. They know how to rejoice. And we are called to rejoice in being made in God's image and being called God's beloved each and every single day. Because when we realize that we are God's, when we realize that we belong to the one who created the universe, we have no time to create idols out of fear or power or certainty. Remember that you are created in the image and likeness of God and that God loves all the creation, especially you, and calls it not just good, but very good. You are God's beloved. Live like it. Amen.